and gentlemen, welcome to ITC video for IFRS 16. This is now part three of the video. If you have not watched the other two parts, I advise you to go back to part one and part two. <clears throat> okay, so part three is going to focus largely on the accounting for lessors. Then I also look a little bit at the group accounting part of things. Okay, so that is the focus for this particular class. Now, for accounting from a lessor's perspective. That's when classification takes place. So you need to be able to classify the lease transaction into either an operating lease or a finance lease. The requirements are straight in the standard. I know you know where to get them, uh, where you need to prove if something is a finance lease or, or not. Okay, so great. Now, if it's an operating lease, what does it mean for you? You already know the answer. If it's an operating lease, you're not going to de-recognize the asset that you've rented out, but rather it remains an investment property in your books. And further on to that, what you're going to do is you are going to be receiving some monies related to the rental of this asset. And those monies, you need to recognize them as lease rentals uniformly throughout the period of the lease. So the equating part of things, you already know that, or some prefer to call it the straight lining of the lease payments. Okay, great. So that's what you do when you've got a lease, um, when you've got a lease, operating lease. Now, if it is a finance lease, what does it mean? I think the finance lease is the common one. How you measure and recognize those ones, okay? So the first thing is, if it's a finance lease, then you are simply saying you have ceded all the rights related to this asset, all the significant risk and rewards related to this asset to another player, which is the lessee. Now, it means you no longer have an asset, ladies and gentlemen. So we cannot continue recognizing an asset in our books. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to de-recognize that asset by crediting the cost of that asset and crediting the accumulated depreciation related to that asset, which means the full asset has been de-recognized from the books of the lessor. Now, what do you have as the lessor? So once you de-recognize the asset, unfortunately, the asset is not being paid for, but rather the lessee owes you a series of payments. So what you then raise is a debtor, which we usually call the gross lease debt, which is simply um, which is simply all the lease payments which are due. But time value of money is important, so we need to remove the element of the unearned finance income from this one. So we commonly call the asset which the lessor is going to have. We commonly call it the net investment in the lease. That is what you then debit. So you debit the net investment in the lease, you credit the asset to de-recognize it, which means the balancing figure becomes your gain or loss on disposal, which goes to the PNL. Okay. So that's what you do. If it's a manufacturer dealer lease, for example, your Croco Motors, your Mazda, where they are really selling their inventory, but through leases, you know what to do. What it simply means is instead of crediting that PPE, what you're now crediting here is a sale because it's a sale transaction. Okay, so you enter your net investment list debit, you credit your sales, and then the VAT issues there. Then you raise another journal entry which will be below, which is related to the removal of the inventory, which will be you then debit your cost of sales and you credit your your inventory. Okay, great. That is if it's a manufacturing dealer lease. Okay. Now, for these types of um, transactions, please take note that we talked about the unearned finance income here. So when we said you need to calculate the net investment in the lease. So this one needs to be the present value of all the amounts which you're expecting to be paid. Now, to be able to get that present value, you need a discount rate. And the discount rate that you use, ladies and gentlemen, cannot be lower than the market rate. So it means sometimes what happens is you get, um, you get a transaction where one says, we are offering you uh, a 1% uh, interest rate. There's nothing called 1% interest rate in this country. We need to go and use the market interest rate to discount that. Okay. 
All right, that's that's the issue. So your discount rate can never be lower than that. Then remember, ladies and gentlemen, that the moment you raise your net investment in the list over there, that is a financial instrument because it is a right to receive cash. So that right to receive cash, that financial asset, has to be incurred. So that means IFRS 9 kicks in over there. You need to be able to bring in the IFRS 9 element with regards to the impairment. So that means you go back again to the impairment model of IFRS 9. Fortunately, this is a list, so it qualifies for that simplified approach. You look at whether the election has been made to use the simplified approach. If the election has not been made, then that means they can actually use the general approach of things. That I think the subsequent journal entries, you know them, those ones are straightforward. When the payment is being made, you need to uh, debit your payments to the bank. You remove the data because the data is actually paid. Then that unearned finance income would have been earned by now. So you raise the income related to that and you remove it from that. These I think you, you actually... So I will not speak too much about the journal entries. I know you did that at CT and you understood them. What I want to talk about for now is... What happens, ladies and gentlemen, if I lease, then I sublease. So I go and enter into a transaction where I am given an asset and I'm renting it. Then I take that asset that I'm renting and I rent it to another, to another person, a third party. What are the transactions going to look like? What are the journal entries going to look like? Okay, so I put it like this. So the standard refers the first contract that we enter into to list the asset is the head lease contract. So this is the original contract that we have entered into. Now, this one, we have already talked about the accounting for that. When you look at, is it a short-term lease? Is it a lease of a low value? If it's none of those two, then that means in your books as the lessee, you're going to raise a right of use asset and you're going to raise a lease liability there. That is if it, it's not a short term. But if it qualifies to be a short term lease or a lease of a low value, that means you are simply going to be expensing whatever that you'll be paying to the lessor in the head lease. Now you then take that particular asset and you rent it to another person again, which is in another contract, which in this case we are going to call it contract B. Then this becomes a sub-lease. Now for that sub-lease, the question now is, how do you as, as this person, the lessee, account for it? Because now you are kind of like, now the lessor is this new one. Okay. Now the idea is, if it was a short term in your head list, there's no way it can be a long term in the sub -list. Because if you've been given two years here, yeah, there's no way that this period can become more than two years. So this one also be limited to two years. Which means if it's short term here, yeah, it will also be short term over there. So your sublease contract will then go into the operating lease bracket. Which means you're going to account for any income which is going to be coming from contract B as lease income. Your right of use asset will, uh, will not have been accounted for since it was a short term there. Now let's go to the top part. Let's say it was not a short term, it was not a lease of a low value. Which means, when you actually got that, you raised the right of use asset and the lease liability. And now you're taking it over to contract B. What does it mean? So you analyze again. Does my contract with contract B result in low, uh, um, in, uh, in, in a short term? If it results in a short term, again, it remains an operating lease, ladies and gentlemen. There's nothing that you will do. But if it turns out to be, um, if it turns out to be actually a finance lease, 
in your classification now is the lessor in the sublease. If it turns out to be a finance lease, that means you kind of need like to uh, remove the right of use asset. Because now the person who now is the right of use asset is what? The third party. This is the guy who now raises the right of use asset. Instead, what now do you have? You no longer have a right of use asset. You now have a net investment in this that becomes a debit. Okay. If you if you didn't get me right there, simply go back to how does lessor account for finance leases. So you simply account for a finance, a finance list as a lessor. So you remove the right of use asset that you entered, that you recognized from the head this point of view, you replace it with the net investment in the lease. But you cannot take out the liability because you owe the head lease sums of money. So the lease liability will remain there. Okay, that one will not go away. Okay, so those are the issues which um, relate to sub leases, which I just wanted to quickly highlight. Then um, let's talk about group accounting. This is an area which is highly examinable, ladies and gentlemen. You need to watch out for this one, and it's addressed in IFRS 3, paragraph 28b. You need to understand what happens in a lease transaction, where oh, sorry, in a, in a in a business combination where the acquiry is the lessee in another transaction. So you need to be able to account for that. Now, let's talk about this. So the standard when you go to uh, paragraph 28b says the acquirer, when the acquirer acquires an acquiry who was already in a lease and the acquiry was a lessee, the acquirer on day one, from a business combination point of view, is required to have all the assets, all the net assets at fair value. Which means this right of use asset which was accounted for by the lessee suddenly has to be at fair value in the IFRS 3 journal entry. So what it means now is the acquirer on that day needs to recalculate the right of use asset which is sitting in the box of the of the acquiry by looking not at the contract terms but by looking at the market terms so what are the market uh, contractual payments which are supposed to be there then use the implicit interest rate which is applicable on that particular day so that we get the fair value the one which is based on the market okay so that one is very important you don't take the right of his asset of the left of, of the acquiry that will be wrong Okay. However, the lease liability, you still continue to use the PMTs or the payments which are based on the actual contractual agreements because that is what you owe, that is the liability which the group actually owes. But you discount that based on the rate which is supposed to be applicable again on the date of acquisition. Okay, So I thought that was very important for me to bring through because people usually struggle now linking the IFRS 16, when it comes to IFRS 3, now how does it talk to each other? This is what I just wanted to, to bring out. There are also elements of possibilities of where the two, the acquirer and the acquiree, had a lease contract together before, before this acquisition took place, which would be kind of like resulting in a reacquired right. But I don't want to spend too much time there because the emphasis of the reacquired rights have been toned down a little bit. But you learned the concepts when you are at CTA level. Let's, let's briefly talk about uh, integration. Be very much worried about how does IFRS 16 get integrated with other topics, with other disciplines, with other subjects. That one is critical, that one is key for you. So let's start from tax. How does it integrate with tax? We've already talked about the VAT aspects. So we can have a question which says discuss or calculate the VAT implications um, related to this lease transaction. This is exactly what came out in June 2018. Okay, so you can revisit that just to get an appreciation of the integration which took place. The question can also come from an audit perspective and say, now audit the lease transaction um, uh, 
financial reporting aspects to things. Okay, so there's something which has been done. The finance director, the FM, they did some reporting on the list. Now audit if that was done correctly. Okay. Now remember, when you're auditing, I wouldn't want to get too much into uh, auditing uh, because the auditing guys are better placed to advise you on how to audit a list a list transaction. Okay. But from my audit days, what I remember is when you are auditing. You're going back to saying, what are the inputs which drive into this figure? So for us to say we had a list liability, we had a right of use asset, how did we get there? What were the inputs to that? And we break down and say, okay, number one, there seemed to have been a list contract which was there. So my audit procedure is probably, you need to obtain the list contract and inspect it. What are you inspecting for? You're inspecting for what are the lease payments which are there? Uh, what are the contractual agreements in terms of the lease period and the ability to, um, to, 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 to actually extend the option of the lease period? What are the um, elements related to substantive substitution rights which, which, which are there? Okay. Are there any substitution rights which might be there? You can only get to know that knowledge if you obtain the contract and you actually inspect it. Then what else do you need to do? Now you have the components. So there's an I, the discount rate which was used. How do you audit that discount rate? Probably I need to recalculate the implicit interest rate which was used. Okay. And by recalculating, how are you going to recalculate it? You're going to obtain the inputs, verify um, those, 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 those inputs. You got you know the audit language which you're supposed to use to use the correct audit language. Okay. So you recalculate that implicit interest rate. You're going to match the PMTs which have been used to the contract. Are there any future values, the guaranteed residual value which are there? You need to inspect if the contract actually gives that guarantee that will give you that residual value in place. Okay, then you really compute the present value of the lease liability. Okay, then from there, now you are going to um, opt. Uh, obtain any, 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 any other documentation which relates to additional uh, costs which could have been incurred, the direct costs which could potentially have been incurred, okay, by probably you need to speak to the, the, the manager who is in charge of lease contracts, okay, so that you get insight into what additional direct costs could have been incurred. Once you get those ones, what do you need to do? You actually need to um, then inspect if they have been uh, accounted for straight into the, in the, the they've been capitalized into the right of use asset. Okay, those kind of things. Okay, uh, the the does the the the, the entity have you know, obligations related to restorations and stuff like that. You know that the kind of thing that you need to do. Okay, so I'm trying to say when you look at the IFO 16, don't look at it from a silent say this is this is an accounting issue. This is a financial reporting issue. No, start thinking about other courses. It can also be integrated with math, okay? Quite possible. I need you to be ready for any particular type of integration which this can potentially have. That's uh, what I had for you with regards to leases. I hope you've quite enjoyed this video class, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, in closing, let me say, thank you. Thank you.